May 22nd, St. Rita of Cascia. St. Rita was born in the area of Umbria, Italy, towards the end of the 14th century. She died at Cascia in the year 1457. She is often represented holding roses and figs and sometimes with a wound in her forehead. In her early life, Rita often visited the Augustinian nuns at Cascia and showed interest in a religious life. However, when she was twelve, her parents betrothed her to Paolo Mancini, an ill-tempered, abusive individual who worked as town watchman and was dragged into the political disputes of the time. Disappointed but obedient, Rita married him when she was eighteen and was the mother of twin sons. For eighteen years, with unflinching patience and gentleness, Rita bore with his insults and infidelities. Also, with a breaking heart, she watched her two sons fall more and more under their father's evil influence, and she shed many tears in secret and prayed for them without ceasing. Eventually there came a day when her husband's conscience was touched so that he begged her forgiveness for all the suffering he had caused her. But shortly thereafterwards he was carried home dead, covered with wounds. Whether he had been the aggressor or the victim of a vendetta, she never knew. Poignancy was added to her grief by the discovery that her sons had vowed to avenge their father's death, and in an agony of sorrow she prayed that they might die rather than commit murder. Her prayer was answered. Before they had carried out their purpose, they contracted an illness which proved fatal. Their mother nursed them tenderly and succeeded in bringing them to a better mind, so that they died forgiving and forgiven. Left alone in the world, Rita's longing for the religious life returned, and she tried to enter the convent at Cascia. She was informed, however, to her dismay, that the constitutions forbade the reception of any but virgins. Three times she made application, begging to be admitted in any capacity, and three times the prioress reluctantly refused her. Nevertheless, her persistence triumphed, and the rules were relaxed in her favor, and she received the habit in the year 1413. In the convent, St. Rita displayed the same submission to authority which she had shown as a daughter and wife. No fault could be found with her observance of the rule, and when her superior, to try her, bade her water a dead vine in the garden, she not only complied without a word, but continued day after day to tend to the old stump. On the other hand, where latitude was allowed by the rule, as in the matter of extra austerities, she was pitless to herself. Her charity to her neighbor expressed itself especially in the care of her fellow religious during illness and for the conversion of negligent Christians, many of whom were brought to repentance by her prayers and persuasion. All that she said or did was prompted primarily by her fervent love of God, the ruling passion of her life. From childhood, she had had a special devotion to the sufferings of our Lord, the contemplation of which would sometimes send her into ecstasy, and when in the year 1441 she heard an eloquent sermon on the crown of thorns, a strange physical reaction seems to have followed. While she knelt, absorbed in prayer, she became acutely conscious of pain, as of a thorn which had detached itself from the crucifix and embedded itself in her forehead. It developed into an open wound which became infected and became so offensive that she had to be secluded from the rest. We read that the wound was healed for a season in an answer to her prayers to enable her to accompany her sisters on a pilgrimage to Rome during the year of the Jubilee, 1450. But it was renewed after her return and remained with her until her death, obliging her to live the rest of her life practically as a recluse. During these later years, St. Rita was affected also by a wasting disease, which she bore with perfect resignation. She would never relax any of her austerities or sleep on anything softer than rough straw. She died on May 22nd in the year 1457, and her body has remained incorrupt until modern times. The roses, which are St. Rita's emblem, and which are blessed in the Augustinian churches on her festival, refer to an old tradition. It is said that when the saint was nearing her death, she asked a visitor to go to her old garden and bring her a rose. It was early in the season, and the friend had little expectation of being able to gratify what she took to be a sick woman's fantasy. To her great surprise, on entering the garden, she saw on a bush a rose in full bloom. Having given it to St. Rita, she asked if she can do anything more for her. Yes, was the reply, 
bring me two figs from the garden. The visitor hastened back and discovered two ripe figs on the leafless tree. Let us learn from the life of St. Rita to pray frequently for the conversions of sinners. There is no prayer more pleasing to God than that which has for its object the conversion of those who lead lives of sin, particularly sins against faith, such as leaving the one true church and practicing a false religion, willful doubt, disbelief, denial, ignorance, and those who commit sin by exposing their faith to danger.